All right, well, we'll continue in Revelation then. Uh, if you will start in Matthew 24, we'll also be in Revelation 8, but um, I want to read these verses in Matthew 24. It goes along with where we are in Revelation 8. Um, where we are is the third and the fourth trumpet judgments that are in Revelation 8. I want to try to cover those. And what's shown there, although that stuff literally happens, it has to do with the apostasy of, of really everybody, both Gentiles and Israel, specifically looking at Israel because that's what Revelation is focused on. And we see from Matthew 24, this was when Jesus was talking to his disciples about the signs of the end times. So he's talking about things that are going to happen in the period that's covered by the book of Revelation in that tribulation period. And I just wanted to look at a few verses here. If you look in verse 4, in Matthew 24, verse 4, referring to, the, to that tribulation period, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So he's talking about during that tribulation period, people coming along and deceiving and then in verse 11, uh, we see the phrase again. It says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then down in verse 24, Matthew 24, 24, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So, the, three times within this one chapter, talking about the end times, Jesus tells his disciples, warning them that there's going to be great deception during the tribulation period. Now, if we look in Revelation 8, uh, where we are in our study in Revelation, I think that helps us knowing the deception, signs and wonders that come about. It said they're going to show great signs and wonders to make you think what they're saying is true, but because it's against God's word to Israel, uh, they're really deceiving them. They're making them think. In other words, a deception is when you pretend that you're, in this case, you pretend you're representing God, pretend that you're representing the truth, that you're telling them, but really you represent Satan and his lie program. Uh, that's what the Antichrist and apostate Israel does. And so they deceive them into thinking they're following the truth when they're really not. So would they be called false prophets? Yeah, there's, in fact, in Revelation over in chapter uh, 13, there is one who is referred to as the false prophet. And he's the one who gets the image of the beast. There's the Antichrist, who is the beast. He comes out of the sea in Revelation 13, and he goes into the temple, declares himself to be God. And then there's the false prophet, and he gets the people to build up the image to the beast and bow down and worship that that image. Um, he's really a type, like the beast is a type of the Christ, so he's called Antichrist. And the false prophet is a uh, reference to, it's an anti-Holy Spirit. Uh, the one, because the Holy Spirit gets us today, gets us to worship Christ. We're led, we have the Holy Spirit within us, and we're led to serve Christ and learn from Him, have the mind of Christ, use that through His Word. And so Satan has a false trinity as well, and that's seen in operation in the tribulation period. Satan is the anti-God the Father. The beast is the anti-Christ. And then the false prophet is the anti-Holy Ghost. So those, that's the false trinity. And, and there are those warnings there that there are going to be a lot of false Christs, a lot of false prophets. So it's not just him, but there are people in apostate Israel who take leadership positions, who are, they're following the Jewish religion, not following what God tells them in His Word. And so then they're going to be proclaiming false prophecies. You see that in the Old Testament. God had His prophets, and then there were a lot of false prophets there who were trying to, they said they represented God, but they didn't. In fact, in Matthew 7, Jesus judges them. I think it's Matthew 7. Yeah, if you look at Matthew 7 and verse 15.
he says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So they pretend, they're false prophets, they pretend to be representing God. But inwardly they aren't. They're ravening wolves. They're part of Satan's program. And you see their judgment down in verse 22. Matthew 7, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name hath cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Three times it says in thy name. So they're taking on God's name. They're saying we represent God. We do all these things in God's name. But yet verse 23 says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Yeah. So um, that's, that's why there's a lot of deception in the tribulation period. Is you've got people who claim to represent God, but they're really part of the Antichrist and that false Babylonian religious system. And they may quote scripture, just like today, a lot of people can quote scripture to come up with their, to support their philosophy, but because they don't rightly divide the word of truth, they're not saying what God has for us today. And so the same thing will be there too. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if these false prophets and things um, that are part of that false religious system quote a lot of Paul's epistles and try to, because that the, the message for today is to trust in the blood of Christ for your salvation alone. It's not, we're not under the law, we're under grace. The message for Israel is you're under the law until you get to the, you know, to the kingdom when God writes the law upon their hearts and they have that new covenant. Um, the message of Paul's epistles is not for them in the tribulation period. So just like Satan gets people to follow the law today and not follow Paul's epistles, he's probably going to get people to follow Paul's epistles and not the law during the tribulation period. You probably say, "Well, see here, all these people, they, you know, they're not here anymore, so they must have believed the truth. So let's follow that, and they'll be following the wrong program." So in Revelation 8, uh, we've covered the first two trumpet judgments and verse 7 and verse 8 and 9. Those are the first two trumpet judgments and really the food and water supply had been cut short. And that's a sign in the Bible. You know, the reason God made humans to where we have to eat and drink every single day in order to survive is to give us a type of how we should be approaching God and His Word. Um, because you'll see things like when the devil tempted Jesus to, to command that the stones be turned into bread, Jesus says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth from the mouth of the Father. And one time when the disciples were hungry, and Jesus says, I have meat to eat that you know not of, he says, My meat is to do the will of my Father which has sent me. He says in John 6, I am the bread of life. And so there's a lot of there are a lot of scriptures that tell you that the reason God made our bodies the way they are to eat and to drink every day in order to survive is to give us a type that really spiritually speaking God's word rightly divided is the food for our souls and our nourishment for our spirit and then if we don't take that in daily it's very easy to get weak in the spiritually speaking. Um, and so with this sign here, these first two trumpet judgments in Revelation 8 verses 7 through 9, uh, you have part of that food and the water supply being taken away. And I think that represents, of course this literally happens, but uh, it's, there's a spiritual truth behind everything that's done. There, and the reason it's done this way uh, is to show really the word of the Lord uh, not being as prevalent because of this false religious system. Uh, the book of Amos talks about a famine. It says there will be a famine in the land, not of bread or of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. Um, that references, I believe, a near fulfillment of the 400-year period between the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, but you can also see it here. Not that the word of God will be taken away. They'll still have it and be able to access it, but it's just the popular opinion will be to follow the religious system, and in that way it's taken away from the people. Uh, just like today, the here... There, the, you could say there's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord in the United States. Um, you can get, you can go to the dollar store and buy a King James Bible and, and read the word of the Lord for a dollar. Uh, but you don't have people doing that. They're looking at other things rather than looking at God's word uh, to guide their lives. So I, I think that's a sign those first two trumpets. And you can see the result then 
of the food and the water be taken away, and this third and fourth trumpet judgments. The result is apostasy, both among the Gentiles and among Israel. So verse 10 says, Revelation 8.10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. Um, your first fill in the blank is that the, a star oftentimes represents an angel. Star represents an angel. If you look over in chapter 9 and verse 1, with the fifth trumpet judgment, you see that. 9 verse 1 says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit. So, uh, you know, it's not just some light that's up there in the heavens. The fact that it's the star falls from heaven, and it and it says to him, so it's a, a person, and it's they're given the key to the bottomless pit. They're able to go down there. Um, shows that it's a, it's an angel. There are other verses too, but that just shows you. Uh, so when chapter 8, verse 10 talks about a great star falling from heaven, uh, that's uh, probably an angel there. And uh, also in both cases, you see in chapter 8, verse 10, and in chapter 9, verse 1, that the star falls from heaven. A falling star from heaven, when it's represented in the angelic realm, refers to Satan and his and his angels, because uh, Satan, when we're told about him falling, it says, um, I believe it's Isaiah 14 that talks about Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou fallen? Uh, he's in his rebellion, he's fallen from his position in heavenly places. And so when you're talking about a fallen star, you're talking about a rebel, an angel who has rebelled. A contrast from that is chapter 20, verse 1. In chapter 20, verse 1, you have an angel, and he ends up, in verse 2, laying hold on Satan and binding him for a thousand years. So this angel, this is a good angel, and so he's part on God's side. And you notice the language here. It doesn't say that he fell down from heaven like we saw in chapter 8 and chapter 9. In chapter 20, verse 1, it says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Uh, so, if the angel, you know, falling is something that you really don't control, it's something that you fall. But if you come, you know, there's a difference between if I'm standing here and I end up on the ground, there's a difference between falling on the ground as, as opposed to just getting on the ground. And um, falling then represents then uh, the rebellion, which would show that this angel here, back in chapter 8, verse 10, well, the third angel sounds, he's an angel of God, uh, but the great star that falls from heaven would be representing an angel falling, uh, a fallen angel, somebody from Satan, who could be Satan himself, uh, but at least one of his devils, uh, if not him himself. Uh, then the next thing we see, it says there, burning as it were a lamp. And the lamp, uh, if we look over in Psalm 119, A lamp in the Bible is a reference to God's Word. We are, um, John chapter 1 talks about how Jesus is the true light which lighteth every man. He is the Word. He is the living Word, so He is that light. Uh, we're told about how Satan is the God of this world. He's the Prince of Darkness. And so this world being in Satan's control right now, spiritually speaking, is in darkness. But then we are lights to the world if we are saved and we have and we use God's word and so God's word is that light to give spiritual truths to people that they may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth and that only comes through God's word uh, we see in Psalm 119 verse 105 Psalm 119 verse 105 the writer here says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path so thy word is a lamp. 
Notice it says, Thy word is a lamp. But look at back in Revelation 8, verse 10, when the great star falls from heaven, it doesn't say it burns, its burning is a lamp. It doesn't say it is a lamp. It says burning as it were a lamp. So the star from heaven is not a lamp. It does not bring the word of God. But what it does is it brings a false word of God. It looks like it. It's an imitator. Satan is the great imitator of God. And so when it says burning as it were a lamp, it looks like a lamp. Uh, the other scripture, we won't go there, but the other scripture I've got in your outline, 2 Corinthians 11, 14, it talks about how Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light. He appears to be given the truth of God, but he is not. He's propagating his lie program. So the fact that we have a star that falls from heaven in this third trumpet judgment, that tells us it's somebody of Satan's realm, Satan himself or one of his devils, and he's giving a false word of God. It looks like it's God's word, but it's not. It is as it were a lamp. And then it says that it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Um, if we go over to John chapter 4 and also Revelation 22. John chapter 4 and Revelation 22. There's a difference between the sea and the rivers and fountains of waters. When we talked about the second trumpet judgment two weeks ago, chapter 8, verse 8 refers to the sea, and I gave some scripture to show that the sea was referring to Satan's realm. Um, that's not the same as rivers and fountains of waters. That's quite the opposite. Rivers and fountains of waters represent life in God. And we'll see that from John chapter 4, verse 14, and also Revelation 22. When God made the creation. If you go through the creation account in Genesis, there is no mention of the sea. Rather, he makes, he makes four rivers in the Garden of Eden. And, and we covered last time about how in Revelation 21, 22, when the new heaven and the new earth are here, there is no more sea. Um, God's, so that, because that's Satan's realm, but God's Life, life in God is represented by the rivers and fountains of waters. In John chapter 4 and verse 14, this is, in fact, let's look at verse 13. Jesus talking to the woman in Samaria at the well. John 4, 13 says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Uh, so, of course, he's talking about the atonement that he receives by believing in what God has told them. Um, but it was referred to as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Or that would you would think of a fountain. If you have a well of water that's springing up, that's really what a fountain is. You ever see these city fountains? They have you know, man-made, but they're, you've got a pool of water. Then you've got the fountain and the water's coming up. Uh, that's the idea here. If you've got a well of water and the water springing up, well, you've got a fountain. And then if we look in Revelation 22, verse 1, this here showing the, the new kingdom after Satan and his forces have been cast out. We have a new heaven and a new earth. And in chapter 22, verse 1, it says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So, when we're back in Revelation 8.10 now, when it says that the great star fell from heaven burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Uh, what that's telling us is that you've got this angel, either Satan himself or one of the devils underneath him, falling from heaven, bringing a false word of God, and it falls upon, really, upon Israel here. The, the true is, well, I shouldn't say Israel of God, but upon uh, Israel here. And a third of them, um, it appears here, is uh, become apostate due to the false word of God that's given. They think it's true. They think what the Antichrist is saying is true. And a third of them are deceived. We read the scriptures earlier in Matthew 24 about how many will be deceived. And the reason they're deceived is because the word that this false angel uh, gives 
looks like it's, it says, as it were a lamp. It looks like the Word of God, but it's not the Word of God. It's, it's Satan's lie program, the Babylonian religious system that the Antichrist will have. And so it's showing you that uh, it affects, this is the many who are deceived, at least a third here of where, where the waters and the fountains of waters and the rivers were, which is representing life in God. Uh, at least a third of them become apostate and choose not to have life in God through this. Um, so, uh, your next fill in the blanks, we've already covered them now. Uh, the next one is rivers and waters represent life in God. Rivers and waters represent life in God, and we re read those verses. And then the next fill in the blank is a quote there from Revelation 18. As it were a lamp shows the Antichrist promoting a false word of God. And we covered that. So, as it were a lamp is your fill in the blank there. Uh, so just from this one verse, I mean, these things literally happen. There literally is a star that falls from heaven. It literally is burning as a lamp and literally falls upon the rivers and fountains of waters. But all of this is supposed to give you is a type. It's a picture to show you what's happening spiritually in in that time, you know, in Revelation 2 and 3, when God gives the messages to the seven churches, each one ends with, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Uh, so they are, if they have faith in God, then they will understand and they'll see this. Of course, you know, this would be a big event. You know, the whole world, if something like this happened today, a star falls from heaven, burning as a lamp, and a third part of the rivers and fountains of waters are made bitter, and uh, many men die of that, and that's going to make worldwide news. Everybody's going to know about that. That's a big event. And if you have the ear to hear, you have faith in what God has said, then you'll examine His Word to say, well, you know, I remember something about that in the Bible. And you end up reading it, and if you have faith in God, He'll reveal to you and figure out, well, this is what's the spiritual application to it. Just like the food and water are there to remind us that we need to be in God's Word daily in order to have our spiritual bodies to have strength. This is a sign of something that literally happens, but is a sign of what's happening during that great tribulation period. That a third of those in Israel, it seems like, are going to follow the Antichrist, be deceived, become apostate during the great tribulation period. And then uh, verse 11 now, it says, And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. It's interesting, you notice the difference here between the second trumpet and the third trumpet. If you go back to verse 8, when it says, and the second trumpet, it says, the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. That's a sign that the Babylonian religious system will be destroyed at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, tribulation period, that God will cast it out and we we went over that at that time but you notice when the sea becomes blood um, verse 9 tells you the creatures in the sea third of them die third of part of the ships were destroyed but no men are killed by drinking the water because it's obvious I it, mean if the the water becomes blood you're not going to take a glass of that and drink it you said you know that's blood that's not good for, I shouldn't be drinking blood so I'm not going to drink that but with the the but in the third trumpet, the water of the rivers and fountains of waters is not turned into blood. Rather, it becomes bitter. Now, blood you can recognize, but bitterness, by just looking at it, you can't tell. That water looks the same as non-bitter water, good water. And the result then is many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And that's again showing you how the Antichrist and Satan, that false religious system that he has, is going to look so much like God's Word, it's going to deceive many. So just like people will look at it and say, that's good water, I'm going to drink it, but it's really bitter and they die. You're going to have a lot of people who say, that's good religion, that's what God is saying, I'm going to follow that, and the result is lake of fire for them. They don't, they don't have eternal life. Uh, so now in the fourth trumpet judgment, verse 12, a uh, similar thing, um, I, I would I would say, this is my opinion, uh, that the third trumpet judgment is relating to the Gentiles and that a third of the Gentiles are, are falling at that, uh, take, end up take, falling meaning a third of the Gentiles take the mark of the beast. 
and worship the image of the beast initially. I think that's what that's referring to. And then in the fourth trumpet judgment, we're going to see that a third of Israel becomes apostate. I mean, really, the focus is on Israel in Revelation, but I think we've got um, Gentiles with the third trumpet judgment and then Jews with the fourth. And then that helps explain the sixth trumpet judgment, because in the sixth trumpet judgment, a third of the men die. So I think what we're seeing here is initially, once the Antichrist sits upon the throne and the false prophet creates the image of the beast and causes people to bow down and worship to it, that initially a third of the entire world is going to be deceived and follow that right away. And the result with the sixth trumpet judgment is that they're going to be killed. And that's a sign to the th two-thirds of the people that are still remaining on this earth that you shouldn't be doing that because the result is going to be eternal death for you. And so, uh, so anyway, we'll look in the fourth trumpet judgment now. Uh, verse 12 says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So the third trumpet judgment is sun, moon, and stars, one third of them not shining. And not only during the day, uh, but it says the night likewise. So the night, you know, you don't have much light out there, but you've got some. You've got the moon, you've got the stars. Well, it's telling you that really you've got complete darkness for eight hours of every day, where there's no sun, moon, or star shining at all for eight eight hour period, well, four hours during the day and four hours at night for a total of eight hours each day. And this I say, um, the fill in the blank here is that this shows that Israel, uh, that these two verses that we've got here, and we'll look at them, show that Israel is a sun, moon, and stars. Uh, so when it says sun, moon, and stars, um, Israel is pictured as that. And we'll see that if we go over to chapter 12, verse 1, and also Genesis 37. When God created the sun, moon, and stars, He said that they are for times, for seasons. He said they are for signs as well. Um, for, unfortunately, Satan has corrupted that, and you see people worshiping the stars through astrology, horoscopes, that type of thing. Um, but they're also there for signs in God's program, and uh, one of them is they are a picture of the nation of Israel, who are, we mentioned that Jesus in John chapter 1 says Jesus is the true light, which lighteth every man that comes into it. Well, if Israel was called to be God's holy nation, set apart to be a kingdom and a priest to the Gentiles, then they are a light in the midst of darkness, or that's what they should have been. We see in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. If you go down to verse 5, you see that the woman, it says, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up into God and to his throne. So we know that the woman then gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ because Psalm 2 tells you that he is going to rule with a rod of iron over the nations caught up to God and his throne. Verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And so basically this chapter here, the woman you can tell is referring to Israel here. Uh, it gives birth to Jesus and she is protected for the during the great tribulation period. Um, and so, but you notice in chapter 12, verse 1, it says she is clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So you got the sun, moon, and stars um, connected with Israel, showing that they are Israel. And then if we look over in Genesis 37, uh, we see that again. And this one probably a lot of people are familiar with Joseph, his life. He has a dream, and in that dream you have sun, moon, and stars. And Jacob, the father of Israel, clearly recognizes from the beginning that the sun, moon, and stars represents the nation of Israel. Um, there was no doubt in his mind about that. So in Genesis 37, he says in verse 6, 
And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, 